Amen. All right. This week in our verse by verse Bible study through the book of Genesis, we're in Genesis chapter number six. Last week, <clears throat> Michaela, get get daddy a water, please. Genesis chapter number five ended <clears throat> with the uh, the introducing of Noah as a character. There's a major gear switch here, and then we're going to start focusing, of course, on the story of Noah's flood. Noah's flood. Now we're going to pick up here in Genesis chapter number six. Verse 1, of course. Genesis chapter number 6, verse 1 reads, <clears throat> And it came to pass when men <clears throat> began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. Verse 2, That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives <clears throat> of all which they chose. Verse number 3, And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in hundred and twenty years. You're going to have to bear with me. I have a mild cold or something going on. A lot of phlegm in my throat, so I apologize for that. But here in <clears throat> verses 1 through 3, we already, you know, we already see attacks on the word of God, where there's strange doctrine, weird doctrine. Of course, here in verses 1 through 3, that people will, will teach, and it's the doctrine of the Nephilim. I want you to look there in verse number 2. The Bible says this, <clears throat> that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the false teaching is that the sons of God are actually angels. Well, let's use the Bible to define you know, words in the Bible for us. Let's use the Bible to define the, the phrase sons of God. I want you to go to John chapter number 1, verse number 12. <clears throat> John chapter number 1, verse number 12. John chapter number 1, <clears throat> verse number 12. <clears throat> but as many as received him, <clears throat> to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And then it says this, even to them that believe on his name. So those that receive Jesus, those that receive God, God gives them the power to become a son of God. Isn't it great just how clear the Bible is? <clears throat> just anything in the Bible, you want to know what it means, it's in there. God will define it for you. So you know what the definition of a son of God is? Someone that believes on God. Amen. Someone that believes on Jesus. It's that simple. Now let's take that understanding. Let's go back to the context and see how simple this is to understand. Now, <clears throat> when you look at Genesis 4, Genesis 5, and Genesis 6, <clears throat> you have a very uh, a common, um, <clears throat> uh, I wouldn't say theme, but a very common format throughout the Bible. Where the Bible will be telling you a story. It will stop that particular story at whatever generation it is. And then if there's not any particular relevant information to give you throughout a few generations, what it will do is it will give you <clears throat> the, the list of the genealogies or the generations up until the next story that's pertinent, pertinent to us. That's exactly what happens here. So if you look at Genesis chapter number 4, once you look at the very end, Genesis chapter number 4, verse number 26, it tells you, And to Seth... To him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. And then it says this, Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. <laughs> now we went over what that means in particular. Oftentimes it can be a specific reference to the moment of salvation when someone asks God to save them. But it also, in many cases, which I believe this is the case here, can be referring to just Christians in general. There, there began to be a righteous remnant. That's why I believe this is referring to. Because right before that, he started talking about Cain. And how Cain was of that wicked one. And how Cain went out and he started basically his own little village. Very early on. So he, at that point, you know, things bring forth after their own kind. So do you think this was a sinful city or do you think this was a righteous city? This was a sinful city, of course, that Cain brought forth. Cain being a wicked man, he's not going to go out being a child of the devil and just start this righteous city and just spawn all these righteous children. And it's just a bastion of Christianity, right? That's not what's going on. So you have this genealogy coming from Cain, which is of, you know, wickedness, which is of the world, which is sinful, right? Then you have the introduction to the righteous line of Adam that came from Seth, which we know is the righteous line that leads to the Lord Jesus Christ. So you have 
the daughters of men, if you will. You have the world's people. You have people that are not saved, the heathen, the pagan, right? Just like we have today of one line, of one genealogy, which make up the majority. But then you have the sons of God. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? You have those that are calling upon the name of the Lord, those that are saved, those that are serving God. So that begins with Seth. That goes down the line. God tells you about some of these men that were calling upon the name of the Lord. Some of the men that were Christians, that were of this righteous line. You have Enoch. Notice that there's a particular genealogy from Seth. Does, <clears throat> excuse me. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? From Seth, there's a particular genealogy of people that are worshiping God. Enoch. All the way down to who? Noah. Then it tells you in first in verse number or chapter six, verse one, and it came to pass. So this is many, many years later, after those generations are, are uh, many of those people are dead and gone. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. So that there, you know, there's many people all over the earth that are spread all over the earth, and there's daughters born unto them. Then it says this. That the sons of God. Now, what are the who are the sons of God according to the Bible's definition? Believers. Believers. And I don't want to just hammer that, but I can show you multiple examples where the children of God, the sons of God, are Christians, are those that believe on Jesus, believe on God, trust Jesus, right? So this is believers here. It says that the sons of God, it says this, they saw the daughters of men. This is just speaking of the daughters of all the men of the earth. The daughters of those that are not saved specifically. Notice the sons of God, they saw the daughters of men that they were fair. Now, that right there, does it look like they're, they're choosing out their partners? Does it look like these men, the sons of God, are choosing out their, 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 their wife based upon you know, biblical principles, based upon her being a godly woman? No. Notice what it says. They saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And then it says... <clears throat> And they took them wives of all which they chose. So do you understand the point that the Bible is getting across here? Is that, you know, the majority of the world, you know, the, always, they're always unsaved. The masses are always unsaved. But there's always a righteous remnant. The Bible teaches that all throughout the Bible. You can find that there's, you know, there's 7,000 men that have not bowed the knee to Baal. So you have this righteous line that it follows of men that are worshiping God. The, men, the, 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 the fathers are doing a good job of passing down traditions of Christianity to their children, and their children are worshiping God, right? But you know what happens eventually? <clears throat> the righteous remnant begins marrying into the heathen. The righteous men, the sons of God, those that are saved, they start taking wives based upon all that they were fair. Not based upon whether they were Christians, not based upon whether they were believers, not based upon whether or not they're serving God. Not based upon whether or not they're calling upon the name of the Lord. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. And this is a good principle that we can take from this about the importance of making sure that our children, making sure that our children marry other Christians. Marry other Christians. That our daughters, that our daughters marry good godly men, and that our men marry good godly women. Right? This is important. This is very important. And <clears throat> when you look at the story of Noah's flood, it all started. The great wickedness that we're going to read about here in just a minute, it all started because God's people started intermarrying the heathen. Think about that. And think about all the warnings all throughout the Bible where God warns the nation of Israel, do not take their wives. Do not marry in with the heathen. Do not marry in with the pagan. You know, and there are so many people that I can think of even personally that grew up a Baptist, that, grew, that got saved when they were young, they were teenagers, whenever. They grew up and then they married maybe like a Catholic woman. And now they, they don't even go to church. Someone in particular, a close, close relative of mine, who, you know, the only time that he ever shows up at our church is oftentimes when, you know, uh, when his wife is preoccupied with something else. When his wife is doing something else. And, the, and his wife is not saved. His wife still will go from time to time. She's an Episcopalian. She's like, basically, that's as close to Catholic as you could possibly get without being Catholic, if anyone's familiar with like Episcopalian. 
You know, we went to their wedding, and it was as Catholic as you could possibly be. I mean, it looked like a Catholic church in every possible way. All the practices, all the traditions, in every way. He marries this woman, you know, probably just based on she's fair. Probably, he looked at her and said, she's pretty. I want to marry her. She's not even a Christian. She's not even saved. And you know what happens? He doesn't go to church. Never goes to church. He, and, 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 you know, I'm not going to name this person's name, but I know for a fact that now he used to never drink. Now he drinks alcohol. Oh, this is what happens. And it's just this slow digression from one generation. I don't want my kids to turn out like that. Right. I don't want, I, number one, I don't want, you know, the church to be destroyed by just marrying, you know, not laying down, any, all the parents just not laying down any rules or, or not really, uh, you know, guiding their children into good, you know, uh, practices as far as how to find a good wife or how to find a good husband. But I personally, as a father, I don't want that to happen to my kids where they grow up and they're just not serving God. They're 45 years old and they're sleeping in on a Sunday. That sounds horrible. That sounds terrible. That's not the life that I want for my children. Amen. I want you to look at the importance of, of uh, you know, not being unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians, as I said, verse 6. Look at verse 14. The Bible says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. <clears throat> for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness. Look at this. And what, and what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Notice that. What part does someone that believes in God have with an infidel? Have with an unbeliever? And then he goes on. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. <clears throat> We should not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You know, a yoke is something that bonds two people, two people close together. Not only marriages, we should not have close friends. Something that you would consider a bond. That's how I define it. Just people say, where do you draw the line? You know, I have people I work with. There's something I can do about that. I'm with these people and I, you know, I have you know, uh, uh, you know, an obligation to go to work and to work with these people every single day. There's nothing I can do about that. But I'll tell you this. I'm not going to have a yoke or a bond between myself and other unbelievers. It's not going to happen. Right. It's not going to happen because here's the thing. They will, they will draw you into their sin most of the time. Most of the time, you're not going to be able to draw them to the light. They're going to draw you into their sin is what's going to happen. And that's exactly what will happen if, if a godly man marries an ungodly woman. Right. Or if, a, 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 you know, either way, you want to reverse it, the opposite. That's what will happen, whether you have daughters or sons. If your children, being godly children, which are serving God, if they marry in to the heathen, your, your child is much more likely, once they're grown and, you know, they make decisions on their own at this point, they're much more likely to stop going to church as opposed to getting their spouse to go to church. That's just the facts. So here in Genesis chapter number 6, what we see in verse number 2 when it says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, the sons of God is that righteous remnant that we were just talking about that leads us back to Genesis 4.26. That's who the sons of God are. It's referring to those that were calling upon the name of the Lord throughout this period of time. And then there came a time when they saw the daughters of men that they were fair. Remember even when Abraham wanted uh, a wife for Isaac, what did he do? Did he just say, hey, go choose one out of the daughters of men? No, he didn't. He said, you know, I want you to go back to my family. Why? Because they serve the almighty God, right? Because they serve God. He didn't just want to marry his son off to anyone. Right? He didn't just say, hey, go find the daughters of men that, they were, that, that, that are fair, that you like, that you think are pretty. <clears throat> Look at verse number three. <clears throat> the Bible says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, <clears throat> for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. Verse 4, the 120 years, now let me say this, the 120 years from this point forward, <clears throat> this is a time in which God looks down and he says, my spirit's not always going to strive with man. 
the, you know, God would send prophets to warn people. So obviously throughout this period of time, the righteous remnant, of course, I'm sure, the sons of God, were preaching the word of God and they were warning. And you can compare this unto 1 Timothy chapter number 3 and 4. They were warning the wicked. They were warning all of these people of God's judgment. Maybe not specifically in, in detail of the flood to come until Noah came and he was informed about that. But God was striving with man before this. Because he said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. And he always strives with man through the word of God. And it talks about how, you know, uh, how the spirit was preaching through Noah when you compare 1 Timothy, or 1 Peter, I'm sorry, chapter number 3. So that's what this is talking about. At this point going forward, there's 120 years. God vows at one point, they have 120 years, and I'm going to destroy all the earth. That's what he's talking about. They have 120 years going forward from this point. Look at verse number four. <clears throat> there were giants in the earth in those days. And also, after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, <clears throat> men of renown. Now, verse number four here, is, re is where really where the, these, uh, these people that get into the Nephilim, these YouTube stars that want to make videos and, and do all this research on all these different things, the angels and aliens and, and all this weird stuff. And it's really people that just aren't interested in the Bible is what it really comes down to. They just, they're already interested in like Star Trek and Star Wars. It's the truth. They're interested. They want something sensational is what they want. They want something that's just... They want something more than the Bible is really what it is. They're not really interested in reading the Bible and coming out with what it actually says. Now, the word Nephilim, the word Nephilim is a word that they throw around. And they say that Nephilim, what Nephilim is, is Nephilim is like this hybrid being. Because the sons of God, they say, were angels. And they're fallen angels, right? And the fallen angels come down. <coughs> it's so ridiculous, isn't it? The fallen angels come, I'm, I'm trying to picture it, but it's so ridiculous. I can't even like do it in my mind in seriousness. The fallen angels come down, and this is the part that's ridiculous, and they see the women, and they just choose out women of human beings. And then they, you know, uh, procreate with them, right? They, they procreate, and then you just have like these, these beings that are like half angel, half human, and they're giants walking around. <laughs> that's what they say. Now, number one, the sons of God are Christians. And, and you see this, the, 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 the clear uh, you know, string going through the streamline and how the sons of God lead back to Seth. Does everybody see that, how that makes perfect sense, and then how they end up intermarrying? That's what's going on here. Seth's line ends up intermarrying with the wicked. That's who the sons of God are. We get a clear definition of who the sons of God are, right? That all makes perfect sense. But the word Nephilim, they say, that word is referring to, a, to this hybrid being, okay? Well, <clears throat> the word Nephilim is just the Hebrew word for giant. That's all that it is. And you know where these people got this is actually, you know, I know it's the NIV. Does anybody know any other versions besides the NIV? The NIV <clears throat> uses Nephilim instead of giant here. They just want to transliterate that word. Just Nephilim. People know what that means. When you read that, you'll know that's a giant. And then you've got all these people that start making these videos, coming up with these weird theories. You know what Nephilim actually is? You know what Nephilim is? It's these, it's these beings of, of, a, of an angel and a human being when they make a child. That's what a Nephilim is. And it becomes a giant. It's like, why did it become a giant? That doesn't even make sense. You know, was the angel giant? Or, you know, that doesn't even make sense. Where do they get this from? But here, that's, what, that's all that Nephilim is. When it says right there, there were giants, <clears throat> there were Nephilim, okay? There were Nephilim, but that just means giant in Hebrew. That's all of that means. And M is, is plural. That's why that's a giant, that's giants. You know what I mean? So right there when it says there were giants in the earth in those days, that's just saying in Hebrew, Neph when it says Nephilim in Hebrew, that's all that it is. That's all that Nephilim means. So people dream up these weird things. But they're just, it's the Hebrew Greek game that they do. When they want to make the Bible say what they want it to, for whatever reason, whether you're, you, you know, whether you hate God's word, like people like James White, and you want to twist the King James Bible to corrupt other people, or that you just want to have fun, 
a, 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 a sinful fun, right? And just I just want to make the Bible say things that are interesting to me. Because I like things to be techy and you know what I mean? And Star Wars and you know, and it's just all this weird sensational stuff that just doesn't, you know. They, and these types of people, when you talk to them, you can tell they're not interested in the Bible. I've run across these types of people all the time, soul winning. And it's always back to, the, they always want to go down these rabbit trails about just the most ridiculous. Who built the pyramids? I don't care who built the same pyramids. The Israelites built the pyramids is what I believe personally, when they were in slavery. Somebody the other day was like, he wanted to argue about that, didn't he? He was getting ready to start with YouTube stuff. I knew that that's what he was going to do. You know, <clears throat> but here's the thing. Let's just read the Bible. This is enough for us, right? We don't need to. We don't need to take this and make. This is special enough. This is a gem right there. This this right here is. This is precious. You don't need to make this any cooler. I don't think it can get any cooler. All right. Amen. <clears throat> so what it says is there were giants in the earth in those days. Now watch this. I'm going to prove to you that <clears throat> that their doctrine, what they teach, is false. Look what it says. There were giants in the earth in those days. And then it says this. And also, after that, watch this. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. Now notice that the giants are there before the sons of God go in unto the daughters. Do you notice that? It says there were giants in the earth in those days. And then it says this. And also, after that. And also after that. So the giants cannot be the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of men. That's not possible. It's just clearly taught in this verse that the giants are already there at that time. So it says the giants were in the earth in those days. And it says this. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them. And then it says this. The same became mighty men which were of old, and then it says this, men of renown. So, men of renown, mighty men, we're going to look at what this actually means here in just a moment, according to the Bible, the definition of the Bible. <clears throat> but the giants were there prior to that, right? The giants are on the earth, then the sons of God go in unto the daughters of men. This is the Christians marrying in with the heathen. And then of that line, there becomes, <clears throat> like it says, Mighty men, and then it's of old, men which were of old, and then it says men of renown. Now, does anybody know what renown means? Exactly. It just means to be famous. Now, is it, here, let me ask you this question because we're going to look at this in just a moment. Being famous, is that a good thing or a bad thing usually? Bad thing usually. So if they're very popular, they're very well known, that's normally not a good thing. <clears throat> I want you to go to, let's look at Numbers chapter number 16, verse number 2. Numbers chapter number 16, verse number 2. You'll see an example of this. I was speaking of men that are renowned. <clears throat> Look at verse number 1 first. Now, Korah, the son of Izhar, Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, the son of Dathan, and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On. On the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses. Now, were those good men or bad men? They're bad men, right? right. <clears throat> and they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation. Now, famous there, we get a definition, because look what it says next. Famous in the congregation, men of renown. So it actually gives you the definition of what it means to be renowned, and it means to be famous. Famous in the congregation. Now, were the Israelites as a whole, did they really have it down? Were they really sound and pure when you read about the things that they go through and the things that they do? They were not. Now, so to become famous or to become a man of renown, normally you're not that great of a guy. So doesn't that actually explain more to you the concept that I just, uh, I just explained prior to this about the, the heathen intermarrying with the sons of God, having children, and then what did they become? Renowned, they become famous, right? And what happened now? All the morals were left behind with that last generation. So even when it says that they became mighty men, men of renown, that's the children of the sons of God. And when you look them up, what type of people are they? Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Is that good? No, it's not good. Go back to Genesis chapter number 6. You see how this makes perfect sense? How what it's explaining is that all the righteousness basically has been filtered out of the earth. There is, there's hardly anyone left at this point. 
Look at verse number, verse number five. It says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I don't know if you've actually you know, thought about what this is saying. I believe it wholeheartedly. It's saying that, that basically the imaginations of man's hearts can, continually is just wicked. He just constantly, all day, night and day, there's something wicked in every man's heart on the earth. Virtually every man's heart. I mean, that's a strong statement to make. I mean, imagine living in a world where every, where the heart of every man is evil. Where every man's heart is wicked and dark. I mean, that'd be a, that'd be a world that I for sure don't want to live in. Look at what it says next. <clears throat> Verse 6, And repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. <clears throat> so it says, it repented the Lord. It's interesting also, the, the, uh, the law of first mention, you look up the word repent, the very first time it's used, who do we see repenting? God. That right there, repent of your sins is debunked. Just right there. The, the definition of the word repenting, re repent, repenting, repenteth, whatever you want to use, just that root word, repent, to try to define that as repenting of your sins is debunked the very first time it occurs in the Bible. So as God's very careful with the law of first mention where God will define the word the very first time it's used, he's very careful to make sure that he applies it to himself here, which we know that God has no sin. Another thing that's interesting is verse number 6. It says, And repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And then it says this, And it grieved him at his heart. God is not a robot. God interacts with us. Think about that. That God says that the wickedness of man grieved him at his heart. It bothered God. God was bothered and it grieved him at his heart. You know what's also very interesting? Verse number 3 says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. So God's spirit, which is what? What do we refer to God's spirit as? The Holy Spirit. He says that his spirit is striving with man like God's fighting with man. And then after that, it says that God was grieved. Ephesians 4.30 talks about grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Isn't that interesting? So you see God saying that he's grieved, and you see the Bible telling you in the New Testament, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And in the same context, when he speaks about him being grieved at his heart, and that's a strong word, saying he's grieved at his core, he's grieved at his heart, like it's really bothering him. In the same context, it says that his spirit was striving with man. He's trying to get man to do that which is right, but man's not hearkening unto his voice, just like very often throughout history and throughout the Bible. So it says there, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, verse 7, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Now notice who he said that he's going to destroy as well. Who did he say he's going to destroy? Man. Man. Did he say he's going to destroy the Nephilim? Or the hybrid man. I don't know if you ever noticed that, but this right here also debunks that false theory. That false, uh, you know, uh, teaching, false doctrine. Because he's destroying man that he created. So, notice, he's the same. Nothing's changed. It's man, mankind, that he created from the beginning. It's not like, like they've changed and now their DNA is all altered. And they'll talk about all kinds of ridiculousness, you know. It's man that he created. He's the same, right? <clears throat> And also, verse number three, I didn't point this out. Verse number three also in the same way debunks that. Because he says, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh. Just the normal flesh and spirit man is what it's talking about. That's who he's grieved with. That's who he's fighting with. It's man that he created from the beginning. There's like six ways to debunk this silly theory just in these seven verses right here alone. So he says, the Lord said, verse seven again, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beasts, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air. Then he says again, For it repenteth me that I have made them. <coughs> but verse 8, <coughs> But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's a good verse right there. Amen. That's a good verse right there. You know, you can see the great grace <coughs> and mercy that God has. He looks at the earth, the whole world's wicked. He could have destroyed the whole world. But, you know, he looks down and he sees one man. He's like, you know what? I'm going to be merciful to you. I mean, that's that. I, I wish that I was that Noah if I was in that situation for sure. It says, but, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, <clears throat> I want you to think about this as well. Is grace something that you earn? We're going to come back to this, you know, shortly. But is grace something that you earn? No. It's not something that you earn, is it? <clears throat> it's something 
That is, it's unmerited favor is a perfect definition of it. It's something that you do not earn. It's something that you do not deserve. Let me say that. or something that you haven't earned, right? It says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his just generations. Now, the word perfect in the Bible just means complete. That's what the word perfect means. It means that he's whole or he's complete. That's what it means. <clears throat> He was perfect in his generations, it says. And then it says this, and Noah walked with God. Now that's the exact same statement that was used in chapter number 5, verse 24, about Enoch. It says, and Enoch walked with God. <clears throat> verse 10 here in chapter 6. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with with violence. So now we're told some specifics on what particular sin or wickedness is in the earth, and it's said to be filled with violence. So people are harming one another. They're hurting one another. They're violating <coughs> one another. <coughs> Verse number 12. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, <coughs> for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So he keeps stressing that the whole world is wicked. I mean, it'd be terrible to live into a, 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 just, a, a just a violent world. You've seen, <clears throat> you know, movies where people will create. Obviously, it's fictional, but it's based on like the apocalypse, and we're just like everything's destroyed. Like you can't even go outside. You're going to be mugged. People are pulling guns on you. You know what I mean? I mean, imagine living in a world like that. Where everything there's just violence everywhere. You're afraid to leave your house. Everyone's hurting everyone. And like I said, the heart, the hearts of men, they're just filled and, 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 and constantly they just have evil in them. Continually, the Bible says. Filled with evil continually. That would be a terrible world to live in. Right. Verse 13. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, I want to explain the timeline on a couple of things here quickly. So, Noah, it tells you, was 500 years old. If you look at chapter 5, verse 32, he was 500 years old when he had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. That's <clears throat> when he had those children. Now, I don't know if they were triplets, whether they're all three born at that time. I have no idea. The Bible doesn't tell you whether they were or weren't. Probably not. But it's probably telling you... <clears throat> That he was 500 years and maybe his last son was born. That, that'd be an easy marker. The Bible's normally very general like that. So it could have been his last son was born at that time. You know, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, <clears throat> uh, the timeline that I want to explain specifically is something that I, I've heard a few people uh, uh, talk about. I think we might have talked about this once before. And I know we talked about it at the church that I was, I was uh, actually ordained at, my father's church. When he went through the book of Genesis, we discussed this a little bit. And uh, so where the confusion comes in is with verse number three. And the Bible says at the end of verse number three, it says, Yet his days shall be 120 years. So God is giving man 120 years going forward. <clears throat> and once that is achieved, once that is you know, consummated, he's going to, obviously the flood's going to begin. He's going to kill all of mankind. So you have 120 years when God says, so that's our first marker, 120 years when God says, in his heart, if you will, he decides, he looks down, and the earth is starting to become wicked, he looks down, and he says, I'm going to destroy the earth. You know, he says, I'm giving him 120 days, okay, at that point. So at this point, Noah may have had two sons. I don't know, like I said, they, all, they may be triplets. But he possibly might have already had two sons. And then his third son was born at the 500-year mark. So this would have been 20 years before possibly when, when, it, when it mentions there that Noah was 500 years old. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? So then from the 500-year mark, you have 100 years until the flood starts. Now here's the thing. Shem, Ham, and Japheth were all three born when God came to him, is, is, is the point. And that's what causes a lot of people to further confusion. So if you look in chapter number 6, when, when God actually comes to Noah, he says in verse number 18, But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife, 
and thy sons' wives with thee. So here's the undisputable point that we can use to create the timeline. We know for a fact when, Noah, when God comes to Noah, let's say that, when God will create a landmark to make this very clear. When God comes to Noah, we know that he, he and tells him about the covenant and the flood that's coming, that he has his children and they have wives also. So think about that. He has his children already born and they have wives. You know, another thing that that does is it doesn't give Noah the amount of time that a lot of people think that he had to build that ark. Because if God said you got 120 years at this point, not to Noah, but just in his heart, he decides, you have 120 years and I'm going to you know, kill everyone in the earth. Well, Noah was 500 years old when all three of his sons were, were born, right? Well, let's say that his last son was born and when, and when Noah was 500 years. Let's just use that as a marker possibly that that's when his last son was born. Well... His last son would have to be, what would you guess, 20 years just to be safe when he's married. Then they all three have wives. Then God comes to, to, to Noah at that point. That would be, he would be 520 years old, and he would only have 80 years to build the ark. Right? That was backwards to you, and that was only the number eight right there. But it made sense to me, right? But <clears throat> you see... You see, everyone understand the timeline, how that works exactly? So you have 80 years, and then... At the 600 year mark, because it tells you in verse number, I believe we looked at this. Yeah, we did, because we we're looking at Lamech and then. If you look at uh, chapter number 7, verse number 11, it tells you in the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month, the 17th day of the month. So you can see, in the, you know, he was 600 years old when the actual flood began at that point. And we know for a fact that his sons already had wives and children. Now, the only thing that could change this is if that 500, 500 year mark. Um, you know, was it the marker of his children? But I think, I think that that's the, the interpretation of that verse. I don't think there's any way around it. It's either there were triplets born all at the same time, or that was when his last son was born, which I think that that is more feasible. And the Bible is very general about numbers and things like that. When you read in the, in the book of Numbers, you know, they're obviously rounding numbers, right? So they're probably here just rounding or, or just kind of being, you know, vague in a sense of when his last son was born. <clears throat> so he really only had 80 years to build the ark. <clears throat> Not at the most, because you never know. Maybe if someone's 30, he had 70 years to build the ark. That's still quite a while, though. Look at, uh, let's begin reading there again in verse number 14. <clears throat> Make thee an ark of gopher wood. So that's the type of wood that he's going to use. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. Pitch is a substance that comes from, that it's like a syrupy type substance. It's a tar type substance that comes from trees. <clears throat> Verse 15, and this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. Now a cubit... <laughs> Is, is from the tip of the bottom of your elbow to the tip of your finger. And the, the, just the rough measurement that people will use, because <clears throat> obviously everyone's cubit is totally different, the rough uh, measurement that people will use is about a foot and a half. It's 18 inches, about a foot and a half. So when we look here, he's going to give us these measurements. He says, the length of the ark. So the length of the ark, he says, shall be 300 cubits. Now in feet... That's 450 cubits, right? So it's 300, 450 feet is long. Hey, I went while I was in Kentucky to the ark, and that thing is stinking massive. You think, like, you see pictures, and you see people walk around, and you're like, man, that's huge. But when you get there, and you stand next to that thing, like, I don't think I've ever stood next to any structure that's like, that would be like a boat. Or, I mean, I've stood next to the skyscraper, but even still, this thing is Massive. I mean, 450 feet long is huge. So it's, it's 300 cubits, that's 450 feet long. And then he says, the breadth, that's the width. The breadth, he's talking about the width of it, is 50 cubits. So that's 75 feet wide, 450 feet long. And then he says, and the height of it is 30 cubits. So that's 45 feet tall. 45 feet tall. And the closer you got up to it, everybody know what, what ark I'm talking about? The ark that Ken Ham built? 
It's massive. It is huge. If you ever get a chance to at least go look at the outside of it, it's worth it. Just the kind of it, there's all different types of things, and and we're getting ready to get more details about the the uh, you know the architecture of how it's supposed to be built and designed and engineered that is incorrect. You know that always wrong about all those things. It's not even that hard. He tells you everything. How do you keep messing this up? And every movie, everybody that wants to uh, you know duplicate it and make a replica of it, they're always wrong. It's very basic. It's more of like a barge type thing. That's what it is. It's not meant to sail anywhere. Right. It's just meant to stay afloat. Yeah. You got one goal, goal here. <laughs> just don't, it, you know, don't go down. Yeah. Right? So it's 450 feet long. It's 75 feet wide. And it's 45 feet tall. So it's a very big boat. Look at verse number 16. It says, a window shalt thou make to the ark. <laughs> And in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower second and third stories shalt thou make it. So I want you to notice, number one, it says that there will be a window to make in the ark, and, and, it, and it says, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. So he doesn't give you any other specifics. He just says just in a cubit. So I'm assuming that's four square. Does everyone know what that means? Just cubit this way, cubit this way, right? It's just a square cubit, right? So then he says, and in a cubit shalt thou finish the bottom. Then he says, and, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof with, with lower, second, and third stories. So there, there are three stories on this particular uh, boat, on this ark. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, <coughs> wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. <coughs> I know I pointed this out one other time. <coughs> Excuse me. I know I pointed this out one other time, but notice how he stresses, you know, I, even I. And it's so... <coughs> It's so uh, perfect that he would put that there, of course, because God knows all things. Because man today wants to just, they, wanna, they want to, you know, <clears throat> delete one characteristic of God, and it's the judgment of God. They just want to act like he doesn't have that characteristic. Like God is not, not a God of judgment. They only want to focus on God being a God of love, and they totally want to just, you know, ignore all of God's judgment. And notice the way that he words that. I mean, it's, you know, it's so clear the point that he's trying to get across. Don't mistake it why this happened. Don't, don't think somebody else, this was somebody else's idea or somebody else did this. He wants you. He's, God is not ashamed of this. Right. Some people are ashamed of God's judgment, aren't they? They're ashamed of some of the laws in the Bible. Some people are even ashamed that God destroyed everything. I've heard people bring this up and try to mock God. Try to say he just killed everybody. Your God just killed everybody. I, even I. Right. Think about that. I, even I. He's not ashamed of his judgment. It's righteous judgment. Amen. The world was wicked. Right. And it's going to be wicked again. You know what? Hopefully those same people aren't here. That have. Hopefully those types of people, hopefully they, their hearts softens and they get saved at one point. But you know what? God's going to bring righteous judgment again. And it'll be just as righteous as it was that time. God's, God's judgment is always right. God's laws are always right. God's commands are always right. And right here, God's not ashamed of it. And we shouldn't either. We shouldn't be either. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. <clears throat> this is catastrophic, of course. This is major. But with thee... Will I establish my covenant? I'm sure Noah loves that word, but two times. Notice before when he was saying it's wicked, you know, how wicked the world is, it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Then he's talking about, I'm going to destroy everything. I'm going to kill everybody. <clears throat> and then he says, but, speaking to Noah, with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark. <clears throat> thou and thy sons and thy wife <laughs> and thy son's wives with thee. Verse 19. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. So this is the first announcement of how he's going to bring two of every animal, right? Of every, specifically of every sort or of every kind is, 
is, is uh, in particular what the word the Bible uses here, of every kind, male and female. <clears throat> Verse 20, of fowls after their kind and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive and take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten and thou shalt gather it to thee and it shall be food for thee and for them. So Noah is also responsible for gathering together all of the food that is going to be consumed by the humans, by him, his sons and their wives and then also his wife and then all of the animals. I mean, that's a massive amount of food. I mean, that's a lot of coordination. Of, you, know, you got, I mean, you got a lot of work to do here. It's a lot of labor in general. But imagine the, just the, the aspect of management on something like that. What do we have? Where are we putting it? I mean, that's a big job. There's a lot of the logistics. How in the world are we going to get all of that here? You know, we got to, we're going to have to build some sort of, you know, uh, uh, mobile device that we're going to, you know, uh, transport all this on. That's a big job, a very big job for, you know, two of every sort of animal that has to be fed. Yeah. And then eight people for a very long period of time. I mean, that's crazy, man. That's, that, that would be a lot of work. <clears throat> Look at verse number 22. Thus did Noah, saying Noah did these things. According to all that God commanded him, so did he. So we see <laughs> the great obedience of Noah. <clears throat> now I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 7. Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 7. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 7. So we've turned to the, I don't know if you've noticed this, but we've went to Hebrews chapter number 11, the, uh, the faith chapter. <clears throat> oftentimes termed as the Hall of Faith, we've went to this particular chapter a few times already throughout our study, different characters that are mentioned. And they're mentioned in chronological order throughout history, right? From the very beginning. It starts going through the, 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 uh, the story of Cain and Abel. It talks about Enoch. And then now we're back here. I want you to look at verse number 7. It mentions Noah. It talks about the great faith of Noah. Look at verse number 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, <clears throat> moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Look at this. By the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. So we see that Noah was warned by God, he says, of things not seen as yet. So something that had not come yet, he was warned of the flood, the great flood that was going to be coming. It hadn't happened yet, and he, and he had to have faith in order to be obedient to those commands, didn't he? He had great faith. But one other thing I want to focus on here is something we mentioned earlier about grace. It said in, in Genesis chapter number 6, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That was verse number 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I want you to look at the very last statement that's made in Hebrews 11. Verse 7, it says this, and became, speaking of Noah, of course, and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. There are a lot of churches that teach, you know, hyper-dispensationalism, right? We would term it as hyper-dispensationalists. They, they don't like that, that tag. They try to put it on someone else. Well, hyper-dispensationalist is someone that, this is what they would say, a hyper-dispensationalist is someone that only studies the Pauline epistles. Well, you can always find someone that's more hyper than you. But when I look at what the Bible teaches, you know, I reject all forms of dispensationalism. When I look at what the Bible teaches, and then I look at all the people that say they're dispensationalists, I say that the guy that says that salvation is different all throughout the Bible is a hyper dispensationalist. I think, I think any dispensationalism is, is too much, but I think that's way, way too much. I think that that's getting into dangerous ground. Now, I think that there are a lot of people that are saved, that believe that garbage, but they got saved first. And they got a lot of things in the Bible they can't explain. Uh, you know, faith without works is dead. How in the world do I get around this? Different dispensation. Let's put that one over here. I'm saved by grace. Let's put that one here. And then you got commandments in the Old Testament that you know, are very confusing. Different dispensation. So they're under the law. You know what it does? And it's funny that these types of people, they're always quoting... Study to show thyself approved unto God. When their theology actually
actually eliminates any study. Right. It actually takes away the responsibility of having to study the Bible. That's, good. That's what dispensationalism does. I grew up in a very dispensational church, and when I started studying the Bible, I realized this is not what the Bible teaches. I realized very quickly that the New Testament, number one, is so clear that everyone is always saved by faith. And I used that, and then I looked into the Old Testament, and then things started to become more clear. You know what? All those verses that I couldn't understand, I just studied my Bible, and I figured them out over time. I just took the time, I sat down, and I studied my Bible instead of writing out, you know, a chart, a dispensational chart. Notice what it says about Noah. It says that Noah became heir of the righteousness, which is by what? It's by faith. Now, most of Hebrews 11 is not talking about salvation, but that is. It says that he became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Was his righteousness given to him because he was obedient? Like it says there in Genesis 6, verse 22, just because he was obedient? No, he was obedient and he did follow God's commands, but that's not why he was righteous. He was righteous because he believed God. He became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. That is so clear. It's so plain. His righteousness was, which was by faith. And that's what we have as a perfect picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior of all mankind. Always when you look at the ark. Amen. Because you know what it has? One door. Amen. There is only one way of salvation from the beginning of time until the end of time. And there always will be one way of salvation. Right. It's through God. It's through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. There is one way of salvation. There has always been one way of salvation. And there will always be one way of salvation. Amen. I can show you that David was saved by grace through faith. Even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man of whom God imputeth, imputeth righteousness without works. Amen. David was saved by grace through faith that he's living under the time period of what they say is the law. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible tells you that if there had been a law given, that, that should be... Uh, I, I'm going to misquote it. Let's go there. Galatians. Go to Galatians. That could have given life is what it says. If there had been a law given that could have given, given life, verily, righteousness should have been by the law. So if the law, people say, oh, they were saved by the law in the Old Testament. No, they weren't. No, they were not. Because the law cannot give life. If there had been a law given that could have given life, verily, righteousness should have been by the law. Then they could have just been saved by the law. God wouldn't have needed to come. God, Jesus, wouldn't have needed to die. If people were saved by the law of the Old Testament, we wouldn't have needed Jesus to come. Right. Why did he come then? Why didn't things just continue as they were? We didn't need him, obviously. You know, in, in any doctrine that downplays the need or the necessity of the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, that's, a, that's an evil doctrine. Right. Whether saved people teach it or not, it's evil. That doesn't matter. You know? <clears throat> there's one Savior, there's one way of salvation for all mankind forever. Yeah. You know, like it. Let's go to Hebrews chapter number 11. While I'm on this, we might as well just go back to Hebrews chapter number 11. <clears throat> I want you to look at Hebrews chapter number 11. I want you to look at verse number 13. It says this. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. And then it says this, and were persuaded of them. Notice that, and were persuaded of them. They died in faith, believing, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Saying they were afar off, and they saw enough of it to persuade them. People are like, well, they didn't understand. I don't, hey, I'm not going to debate with you the details of what they knew, but they saw enough to be persuaded, and they died in faith. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. And it says, and they were, and they were persuaded of them, and it says, and they embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So they, they saw enough of the promises 
to be persuaded, and not only that, to cling on to it. To, to, be, embra to be persuaded and to embrace the promises. <clears throat> Salvation has always been the same. Adam and Eve were saved by grace through faith. The reason that the law was given in the first place was to tell you you need a savior. If you could be saved by the law, then that makes zero sense. Do you understand what I'm saying? If, the, if you could be saved by the law, then the law is teaching you the opposite. It's teaching you, hey, you don't need Jesus, just get saved by the law. Just save yourself. It's meant to show you that you're a sinner. By the law is the knowledge of sin, Paul says. When, when you're given the law, sin revives and you die and you realize I'm a sinner. And then when, when, and then when someone comes to preach the gospel unto you, it makes perfect sense. When we go to somebody's door, they have a, you know, they, they, if, they know if they've been churched at all, they know the commandments and they know in that sense that they've sinned, but they also have a conscience. And they know that I've done things that are wrong. Right? They got to the age where the law was in their heart. They understood it. They sinned. And it didn't teach them that they didn't need a Savior. It actually taught them that they needed one. They needed to be saved. And that they're not good and they're not righteous. And that they needed to be saved. And there's only one way of salvation. And there always has been only one way of salvation. And there's only one gospel. There's only one good news. Amen. And, then, and that is that. Here's, let me just say this. And that's that the Messiah is the Savior. That's the basic way to explain it. And you, know, and you know, the details were that he came and he died on the cross and he was buried and he rose again. And those details were slowly revealed throughout history. Throughout time, God slowly gave more and more information on how and which mankind would be saved by the Messiah. But we're told all the way back to Adam that there would be a Savior that would come that would redeem them from the sin that they committed. The Messiah would come and he would redeem them. Then we see Noah receiving a covenant here. I mean, who else is God going to make that covenant that he made with Adam and Eve with? He doesn't really have a choice, does he? He's saving one family, so it's going to be Noah that he's making the covenant with, and then with one of his uh, sons, and it's Shem. That's where Semite comes from, like the Jews are called Semites. Someone says they're anti-Semite, like you're anti-Jewish. Well, that's because they say they trace their line back to Shem, which is Sem in the New Testament when you see uh, Shem translated, or, yeah, transliterated into, from Greek into our language, <clears throat> it's translated into English, it's Sem in the New Testament. That's where that comes from, Semite. So that covenant went from Adam and Eve and went down, down that righteous line, was given to Noah, and then to Shem, was passed on to Abraham. And when it was given to Abraham, there was more clarity that was given. Of your seed, all the nations of the world would be blessed. And the same gospel that was preached unto Abraham is, to, you're told in Galatians chapter number 3, is the same gospel that Paul preached to the Gentiles. The same exact gospel. Exact same gospel. But do you know what? Paul preached it in more clarity. There was more information given. And you know what? Abraham, you know, he saw the promises afar off. He didn't understand all of it, but he was persuaded. He didn't understand everything, but he embraced them. And he, and he knew that he was a stranger and a pilgrim on this earth. The Bible even tells you in Hebrews 11 that he sought for a city whose foundation and maker was God. He knew that God was going, that God was going to come of that line. Or let's say this, that the Messiah, the Savior, was going to come of that line and was going to bless all the earth. He may not have understood all the details, but he knew that God was making a covenant with him and that the Messiah was going to be coming of his line. And that there was going to be a blessing that would come from his line. You know what? Whatever details he understood, he was persuaded of them. And he, and he believed them. And then he embraced them. And when you look at that ark, how many doors are on it? Seven? Except for the seven dispensations? No. There's one door. Amen. One door. And the same door that Noah went in is the same door that I go in. Amen. And it's the same door that David went in. It's the same door that Paul went in. It's the same door that every Christian ever will go in. Amen. Always. There's one gospel, my friend. There's one gospel, and it's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it is. It's, it's the same gospel that, has been all, that, has been, that was preached unto Abraham. But we have the blessing of being able to preach it in more clarity and with more power today. So we should be thankful for that. And Hebrews actually tells you that repeatedly, 
that we, that, that we are given greater things, greater promise, all these different things, and that who much is given of him, of whom, of him shall much be required. You know, so we should, when, when, you know, when we go out and we preach the gospel, you know, you need to realize how, how precious that that is. The opportunity of being able to live in, live in the New Testament and the clarity that we can go to someone's door and just explain step by step every detail how in which the Messiah died for you and is going to save you. That means something. It really does. When Noah preached, it wasn't as clear. <clears throat> he told him, hey, you know, you know, when Noah went out preaching, people always picture that Noah was preaching. And I preached a sermon about this. Preaching about the coming judgment. That's not what he was preaching about. It was already a covenant that only his family was getting in there. You think he's telling people like, hey, maybe I can convince God to allow two more people in the ark. It's not what's going on. He was preaching the gospel. He was preaching that you, you can be saved, not from this water, but you can go to heaven with God, just like Enoch did. The same gospel that Noah preached, the same door that Noah went through, is the same door that anyone that has ever been saved throughout all history will go through it's the same gospel. One gospel. Let's bow right and a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you that we live in a time where we have the gospel in more clarity than ever. We thank you, dear Lord God, for all the great things that you've done for us. We thank you for this church. We ask you to just give us the knowledge, the wisdom, the resources, dear Lord, that we might grow this church up, dear Lord, for you, dear God. So we can do more work for you. We can glorify and bless you even more so, dear God. We, we love you, and we ask you that you would be with us, guide us. And help us to just grow as Christians more and more each day and to have the right heart. And bless anyone that's sick. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.